day, saints. I'm so excited to be with you. And yes, it is time for the book of Revelation. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you right now that as we come around your word that you are going to move by your spirit. And Lord, I pray that we are going to learn all that we need to do. I pray for a spirit of revelation to flow today in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Well, folks, I want to just say, it's an absolute honor and privilege to be with you today. We are busy with session number 30. All right, can you believe it? 30, but we're only in chapter 10. All right, we're busy with chapter 10, and we're going to go from verse 1 to 11 today. And we are dealing with the little book. So just as a, a means of introduction, I just want to remind you that we are still in the gap. Just have a look at the picture on the screen. All right, we are between the, uh, the trumpet number six and seven. All right, that's how the book is made up. There's a bit of a breather and a bit of a gap and interlude. And so we are still busy with the two chapters that is part of the interlude. Okay, so let's get right into it. And so remember that we have just finished the, uh, the sixth trumpet. And so we are now looking at the two things that happen as part of the interlude. All right, the first one is the little book. All right, it's called the little book. And I want us just to read it, a few verses, and then I will explain as we go along. All right. Revelation chapter 10, verse 1 to 11. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, when he cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now when the seven th uh, thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up the things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. The angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, and the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be delay no longer. Okay, so I'm going to just take these few verses first, and I'm going to deal with them, and I'm going to give you some detail on it. So I want you to see what happens. There is a mighty angel that comes down. All right, the mighty angel has a little book open in his hand, and as he sets his foot, one foot on the sea, one foot on the land, seven thunders start uh, uttering their voices. Now, this is quite interesting because there are a lot of theologians, a lot of books been written about what these seven thunders said. Um, but let me tell you something, none of it is true. The Bible is very clear. If we wanted to know it, God would have put it in the Bible. He would have put it in the book of Revelation and we would have known that it was that. But let's start off right at the beginning. Okay, verse 1. I want us to go back there quickly. I want us to look at this mighty angel. Who is this mighty angel? Now I just want to make uh, a comment here that there are many scholars who believe that this is Jesus Christ. I personally do not believe that it's Jesus Christ and I'm going to give you my argument for it. All right? You will see that the term angel of the Lord is mentioned many times in the Old Testament. Now there is a lot of scriptural backing to prove that the angel of the Lord could have been Jesus Christ, okay, appearing to people. But it was in the Old Testament. You never see Jesus Christ ever in the New Testament portrayed as an angel or a being or something else. Because Jesus Christ is here. Whenever you see Jesus Christ appearing, it's like when Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. He knew it was Jesus it was not an interpretation. And one of the other major reasons why I don't think that this angel is Jesus Christ is remember that Jesus Christ 
is instigating everything from heaven. Okay, and Jesus Christ did not come down to earth to come and sort this out. What I believe the mighty angel to be, who it is, personally, I would say it's Michael. Okay, um, because Michael has always been sent as the warring angel. Um, I personally just believe that it's Michael um, because his name even means that he's similar to God. Okay, and so I, I think it's either Michael or Gabriel, one of the two, but I personally would go with the argument that it would be Michael. Now, this doesn't change your theology, doesn't change your, your, um, uh, your salvation or anything that you really believe. These are mere opinions from the theologians, okay, just so that you've got an idea of how people think. And the reason why they think that this is Jesus Christ is, firstly, the lion roars because he's from the tribe of Judah. Um, secondly, the rainbow around him. Okay, there's images of him uh, with a rainbow um, in the Old Testament. And so there's a lot of things that, that point towards it, but it's not, it's not sound um, argument. All right, now, I want to just mention this little book. All right, this little book is very, very important. Because this little book literally is the title deed of the earth. It is the ownership of the earth. Now remember that up until this stage, Satan has been controlling the earth. All right? Remember that after Jesus Christ died, the Bible says that all authority has been given to him. And it is very interesting to see what happens at this point. Because the little book literally has the title deed who owns it. Now, Jesus Christ has never laid claim to the earth yet. He's allowed the church to operate in his authority. And he says, go and go and do the works that I did. Go and take authority and do what you need to do. But nowhere in scripture do you ever see that Jesus Christ actually comes down to take control. But what is interesting now is, is that he sends this mighty angel representing God. And you'll see now because he swears by him and suddenly takes ownership of the earth. And so from this point on, it's quite significant for you to know that everything is done by his permission. Okay, because we are going to get into um, some chapters now where Satan is literally going to be loosed over this earth. Like up until now, nothing has to do with Satan. Satan has had no control over what has been done here. Okay, but in the second half of the tribulation, Satan is loosed. And evil is allowed to abound. And so I want you to understand something. That it's done under the control of Jesus Christ. Alright, let's have a look. When this angel comes down, he puts one foot, verse 2, one foot on the sea and one foot on the land. So he says, listen, I'm taking control over both. Now, then, now when the seven uh, thunders utter their voices, he was about to write all of this down the minute that this um, angel put his foot down and they heard the cry. Verse 5. An angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised up his hand to heaven. It's almost like, you know, when you're going to swear an oath and he lifts up his hand and he says, listen, I'm declaring something. And listen to this. And swore by him who lives forever and ever. Who's that? Jesus Christ. That term is forever and ever. Who created heaven and the things that are in it. The earth and the things that are in it. The sea and the things that are in it. And so I want you to see that he makes an oath. And he says, listen. He is laying claim to this property. But what is interesting is, he finishes the statement by saying, 
that there's going to be no more delay from here on in. What delay are we talking about? Well, we are talking about the judgments that you will pick up on the seventh trumpet. Remember the seventh trumpet? Okay. He says, from the seventh trumpet, there's going to be no more delays. So from the time we hear the seventh trumpet, remember we're between six and seven now. When you get to the seventh trumpet, there are going to be no more delays, no more holding back. In other words, God is going to accelerate things. What is God going to um, accelerate or, or stop the delay from? What is this delay? Well, you have to know your seals. Let's go back to seal number five. And remember the martyrs. The martyrs that had died in this time were calling on God to move and have justice and vengeance. Let's go read Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 to 11. And they crowd with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? When a white robe was given to each of them, sorry, then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. See, there's the delay. Until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they are was complete. So I want you to see that the Bible says that by the seventh trumpet, this number is obviously complete. And God starts moving into a judgment mindset and mode. The difference here is he's not going to bring the judgment. He's going to allow evil to be loosed. And evil is going to bring the judgment in itself. So verse 7. But in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he's about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished. And he declared to his servants the prophet. Now I want you to understand that people catch this and they get this wrong. There's the mystery, there's many mysteries, okay? There's like 14 different mysteries in the Bible. But many people take this as the mystery of the church. It's not the mystery of the church. The mystery of the church is gone. The church is gone. We're out of here. We're not involved in this, okay? But this is the mystery of God. Now, which mystery are we talking about here? Well, firstly, I want you to see that the mystery of God is now complete. Okay, so when the seventh trumpet blows, then you know that this is now complete. As I said, it's not the mystery of the church. In chapter 4, the church is gone. We are not involved in this, so it can't be the church. But what is this mystery? It is the mystery of iniquity. Now, what do I mean by a mystery of iniquity? Remember that from the seventh trumpet, all godly restraint is lifted. Okay? There is no restraint whatsoever from God. Everything is lifted. And Satan is revealed, the Antichrist, the false prophet, and all hell breaks loose, and God does not stop it. And so there is a mystery of why is God using evil? I want us to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 to 10, and it describes this time. Remember now, we're getting close to where God is going to allow Satan free. To be, when I say free, I mean unrestricted. Verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 2, 6. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. That's the Holy Spirit. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he now restrains 
will do so until he's taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit will do some restraining until he gets taken out of the way. And then lawlessness, the lawless one will be revealed. So in other words, after the Holy Spirit has been taken out of the way, there's a time and then the Antichrist gets revealed. Whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. He can do miracles. He's going to be so impressive. I want to tell you right now, if he rocked up right now, I'll tell you without a doubt, many church people would follow him. Because he's going to come with lying wonders. Verse 10, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. Okay, so now you can't just get saved when he's out here. Now, now trouble's coming. The mystery of why sin is permitted to wreck the world will be finished. Listen carefully. The mystery of why sin is permitted to wreck the world is going to be finished. So from this time, sin is going to wreck the world. Destroy things like you can't believe, and you'll see as we get into the next few chapters, you're going to see that it's going to be disastrous. But God has allowed it to bring the judgment. And so this mystery of God, this mystery of iniquity, this mystery of sin is going to be finished once and for all. Because when Jesus Christ comes and he corrects that, it is no more ever to be again. Okay, no more in our futures will we have an issue with sin. Because of what Jesus Christ is going to do. So I want you to see, get the picture. This angel comes down. He's standing on the land. He's standing on the sea. And he's basically saying, listen, get ready because the seventh trumpet's going to blow. And it's going to declare some stuff. Number one, God's restrictions are coming off. And he's going to allow sin to start raging. Number two, it means that God is controlling the earth because he's allowing the sin. He is now in control and at any given time he can put an end to it. Okay? We don't see God coming to control our earth like this before. Only when Jesus Christ comes back do we get a full picture of Jesus Christ coming ownership and taking control. But now, having said this, Let's get to the book that's in his hand. All right? So now there's mighty angels standing there, and he's just declared that, listen, there's a lot of stuff that is coming with the seventh trumpet. And it hasn't happened yet. It's going to come. And it doesn't even happen with the next section when we deal with the witnesses. It still hasn't come. But when that trumpet comes, there is a shift. Okay? But let's look at the little book. Verse 8, then the voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the earth. Now, what is this little book? Where does the little book come from? Why is it so significant? Why must John go and eat something? Okay. Most theologians agree that this is the book that we find in Daniel, chapter 12, verse 4. The instruction that God gave Daniel, and he says this, verse 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So he says, I want you to seal this until... The time of the end. 
Very important statement. I'll explain now. And he says, go your way, Daniel, for the words, verse 9 now. And he says, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, I want to make a statement here. Those words are signed up until the time of the end, not the end of time. In other words, it's not sealed until the end when Jesus Christ comes and sorts out everything. It's sealed for the end times. And so most theologians agree and have, a, have an understanding that this little book that John is going to eat is exactly the same book that was sealed up by Daniel. And so verse 9, Revelation chapter 10 verse 9. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it. And it will make your stomach bitter. And it will be sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach began, I became bitter. Now, what on earth is going on here? Let me tell you what this is about. This is where John looks at what is going on in the book of Revelation. And he has two distinct pictures. Number one, Jesus Christ, the Lamb, and the victory that is His. The victory that is the Lamb's. The victory of Jesus Christ, as He has watched this thing progress, as you watch Jesus Christ open the seals, then you start with the trumpets, and later on you're going to get the vials. And He's looked at this, and He's looked at this wonderful demonstration of victory, of the plan of God, of everything that God has said is going to happen. And he looks at how Jesus Christ comes back, and you're going to get more of the picture, uh, with his bride. And you see this victorious plan that God had worked out to bring justice back to our planet. And to deal with sin and corruption and whatever else the devil's got. Now, as sweet as that is, there is a bitterness that comes with it. What is it that made his stomach bitter, that made his soul so bitter? Because he looks at the other side. And he starts seeing the devastation the destruction, the suffering, the perverseness, the whole strategy of Satan and seeing how Satan has absolutely ripped up and destroyed our planet. You see, you think the judgments of God are tough. Wait until you get to the second half of the book of, uh, of the tribulation. Everything that Jesus and God did is in the first three and a half years. After that, it gets really tough. Okay, even though God does do some, the vows end up crisscrossing in this time. But the point is, the second three and a half years is what we call the Great Tribulation. That's the section where God, Jesus says, if God did not reduce the time, not one person would have made it. And we're talking about just living. Okay? And so, the stomach became bitter when he meditated on the suffering of the coming of the world uh, that was coming onto the world, particularly onto the Jews and his nation. How that under the Antichrist, the beast and the results of the vials that, the vials that come he understood that he was in a place of total conflict, being brilliantly sweet and victorious, 
but yet being so bitter and hurt by the destruction of what is about to take place. And so verse 11. The angel said to me, You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues and kings. What does that speak about? That is exactly what John did. He wrote the rest of the book of Revelation. He prophesied it. The whole book of the, of the book of Revelation is a prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says that you're going to prophesy about the many people, the nations. He starts explaining everything. As we get further on, I'll explain it all as we go. But the issue is this. John understood the intensity of this little book. Daniel sewed it up and sealed it for this season. I want to tell you right now, when these men of God saw the future and realized the intensity of what was coming onto this planet, I want to tell you something that affected them. Ladies and gentlemen, let us not play games. Let us not take these things for granted. Let us understand that God wants us to do something supernatural. But God wants us to get people born again. If I have to end every single session with a call to getting born again, it is worth it. Saints, I want to ask you, are you doing your job? Are you spreading the gospel to make sure that people are not in the state of being unsaved when this starts happening? I'm expecting the body of Christ to stand up and to make a decision to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with all our hearts to be obedient to what He asked us to do. And so right now I want to challenge you, if you are not born again, if you've not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart, I want to give you an opportunity right now. I want you to pray with me. Lord Jesus, I ask you please to forgive me of all my sin. I admit that I am a sinner. I admit that I have done things wrong. I ask you please to forgive me of all my sin. I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. I thank you, Lord, that as I pray this prayer, that you will come and live in my heart. I thank you, Lord, that as I accept you as my Savior, you accept me as your child. And I thank you that you wash my sins away because of what you did on the cross. And your blood was shed so that I don't have to go to hell. I thank you that I am born again, I am a child of God, and I love the Lord Jesus Christ. If you have prayed that prayer uh, for the first time, I want you please to send us an email so we can just help you and get you going. Alright, send it to believers at fathersheart.co.za and send us an email and say, listen, I prayed that prayer. I became born again on this date and time. Because I believe that this is the most important thing that I can do in the book of Revelation. Is to get you out of hell. And to get you to a place where you are not going to be involved in any of these things that we're talking about. Okay, so right now I want to pray. For us as Christians. Father I thank you right now. That as John had a revelation of what was good and not good. Lord I pray right now that we'll have an earnestness in our lives. Lord that we will go and do what you're calling us to do. And we'll be obedient. And Lord that we will go make a difference wherever we go. In Jesus mighty name. And everybody said. Amen and amen. Well saints I want to bless you. I want to just say thank you for joining us today and I will be with you next time. 
as we start going into the two witnesses, who are they? What are they doing? And what's so significant about them? All right, we'll deal with that in the next session. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. See you again. Amen.